And I came back to this last verse. I said, you know what? You got three things, and this is the three things I'm gonna give you today. You got the Spirit of God, you got the Word of God, and you got the people of God. And here's the deal. Spirit of God. What I'd like you to do, guys, and, and women too, whenever you have that inappropriate thought, take it to God in confession immediately and tell him exactly what it is. Don't just go, whoops, okay, oh, no. Be clear. Say it to God in prayer. Be authentic. It's what confession is, agreeing with God with what this is. And then help him transform in obedience. Ask him to help you to transform in obedience as he's the transformer. Any thought like that towards your wife. That's amazing. David in the Psalms gets there with God. He, every Psalm starts, oh God, do this to my enemies. Oh God, I feel like this. And at the end he says, oh God, you transform me. And that's all you're doing there. And that is so powerful. Quit trying to do it on your own. And if you're in an adulterous affair or you're starting an emotional relationship that you shouldn't start, man, run like Joseph. Get away from her. Get away from him. And guys especially have tried this to make your life live with your prayers. See women, see females at the soul or heart level. Look at them in the eyes. Uh, Arterburn writes, in every man's battle, bounce your eyes. Don't look. If you find yourself looking at a woman's body, don't look anymore. But look them in the eyes. Look them at the heart, the soul level. It's what you're designed to do. Quit trying to rip their bodies from their soul and their spirit. Girls, you can help do that. My brother gave a sermon on this, and, and uh, you know, the guy's got the problem with the eyes. So he's, my brother says three things. Don't wear something that's too tight, too short, or too revealing. For too tight, too short, too revealing. Too tight, too short, too revealing. First Peter, especially in church, too. First Peter 3 says that you're not designed for that. You're not designed to show that to other people except your spouse. You're designed to have the purity of your heart and your intimacy with God have that revealed with your life. And if you're married, I think if you're not married, I'd stay away from this as couples. If you're married, I think you should pray together. It's been really hard for me to implement that in my life because I don't know, I don't have any problem speaking in front of large crowds. I did auctions in front of big crowds and televised on ESPN. I love all that. But to be intimate with my wife alone in prayer and take that lead, that's really vulnerable. But we've done it and it's been great for our intimacy together, our relationship together. So couples should pray, married couples should pray audibly together. Second, we have the word of God. Were you given the First Thessalonians passage on a laminated card when you walked in? Guys, when you're tempted, quote scripture. It's what Jesus did. Quote scripture. Power equipment here has 10 different laminated cards that they're using for guys to use. Quote scripture. And women do the same thing. And couples, married couples, study the Bible together. That's intimacy. It's the Ephesians 5 thing coming. And the people of God. Authentic community. Uh, Kelly and I were talking about this. This is only as good as the authenticity that's brought to it. But I believe with all my heart, I think women too, I'm going to focus in on the guys because I'm a guy. I believe every single man should be in a relationship that's authentic with another man where he confesses what he confessed to God there under the spirit of God. Where he says, I am tempted to do this. I am emotionally connected to her. And that puts flesh on God. And I've, I've had a, a, a relationship like that with a guy for about 12 years. We're not just talking about sexual temptation all the time. But it's a place to do that. And it's a safe place. And getting that out, in many cases, is the difference of you going forward and mulling that over, as James 1 talks about, and making that sin versus not making it sin. Every guy needs that. And every guy can get a brochure uh, out in the foyer about the mentoring program that's available it's mad mentor accountability and discipleship we have the brochures at the men's table in the foyer every, i'm going to say it again every man 11 12 years old up got to have a guy like that women i think you should too have a woman like that um, but you need to determine how that works 
Transforming result, here's what happens. Wives who respect their husbands, it's what Paul writes in Ephesians 5.31, they just want to be your knight in shining armor. They just want to be respected. And we realize that desires are not for our gratification nor their elimination, but for their transformation, then that's what happens. We make it about them, we make it about God, and we quit white-knuckling selfishly those desires to be gratified. And then we have husbands who intimately love their wives, wives who respect their husbands, and marriages and families and communities who love God. I want to close with a story. Aurelius lived in Milan, Italy, several hundred years ago. He was brilliant. He was handsome. He was educated. He was persuasive. He held the most uh, envied professorship in the city. Life wasn't easy. He lost his father when he was a teenager. He had a mistress for 15 years. They had an illegitimate child together. He was engaged to a young girl, and that wedding at this moment we're going to come into his life was two years off. So just like I talked about earlier, he's sleeping with another woman. His mother, Monica, has been praying for him to fully surrender his life to Christ since he was a little boy. And he's taken some time out of his busy schedule to meet with a guy who's a high-ranking government official uh, in his city. But this official... This man who's going to meet with Aurelius is fully surrendered to Christ. And he starts to ask Aurelius, this man does, about uh, his journey and where he is, spiritual journey. And Aurelius responds, during my university days at Carthage, I found myself in a hissing cauldron of lust. I grew proud in the imagination of my heart. And he shares that with with his visitor. Then later alone, he was thinking, I am utterly depraved. The mind alone is no match for the seduction of evil pleasure. And regarding his thought that full surrender to Christ meant total change from his misuse of sex, he said what my friend said to me, part of me wants to, part of me is unable to. And Aurelius, while crying out to God over the sexual desires that were preventing him from fully surrendering his life to Christ, because he wanted him gratified. He said, they can't be eliminated. i got to have him gratified. He heard this small voice that sounded like a child's voice coming from next door. And it said, take up and read. Take up and read. And he has an open Bible on the table because he was studying the letters of the Apostle Paul. And it's open to Romans 13, which says, let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. And listen, rather clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. And at that moment, he got on his knees and he fully surrendered his life to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And nine days later, having her prayers answered, his mother Monica died. You see, that person you and I know as St. Augustine, the Archbishop of Hippo in the fourth century. Augustine was the... uh, one of the most influential men, not only in his lifetime, but to ever live. Almost every sermon is influenced by the thinking of St. Augustine. Because for 44 years, he studied the scriptures. He defended the scriptures. He's a great mind. He's one of the greatest minds God ever created. And sexual desires were his barrier to God. But Augustine realized that sexual desires are not for his gratification nor their elimination, but for their transformation. And it all happened. This is what's so cool, and we'll close with this. The Spirit of God, he heard a still small voice. The Word of God, Romans, was sitting there open on his table. And the people of God who came around him, his visitor, the government official, and his mother. And church, that's what we have. And that's why we're different. And we can change the world with this concept. Please stand and I'll I'll pray. And now, God, in one of the most difficult topics to talk about and discuss, I just pray that as I prayed prior, alone with you, that it was your words, not mine, and that God, God, your transforming Holy Spirit was at work here today. And I'm reminded that that's in the present tense. Paul said, he gives, God gives you 
the Holy Spirit, that three-phase power tapping into the community of God. And God, may it be so in this place. God, if someone's struggling with an emotional affair or a physical one, God, help that person run. May that person go get help from a brother or sister in Christ and run. God, for a high school student who's struggling or maybe in a relationship that he shouldn't be in or she shouldn't be in, God, help him to run and help him to run to their intimacy with you. And God, by the Spirit of God, by the Word of God, and by the people of God, may we as a church experience transformation of our desires, God, not for their gratification nor their elimination, but for their transformation. And may it be so in this place, in Jesus' name, amen.